set down for economics. In particular, his intention was to analyze the fundamental definitions, this is a quote, sorry, to analyze the fundamental definitions of the legal form in the same way that political economy analyzes the basic, most general definitions of the commodity form or the value form. Just as the commodity was the cell form of capitalist society, according to Pashukhanis, the legal subject was the cell form of law in general. For Pashukhanis, law as such arises on the basis of conflicts of interest in society. If there were no such conflicts, there would, be, there would merely be technical regulation, not legal regulation. There's a strong distinction between technical and legal regulation. You, he illustrates this using the example of a doctor for whom there exists a set of rules and regulations of treatment which should be applied and respected. Those regulations, though, are not legal. The lawyer has no place in that set of relationships, in the pure doctor-patient relationship. The lawyer's role, and this is another quote, begins at the point where we're forced to leave this realm of unity of purpose and to take up another sample, that of mutually opposed separate subjects. From this point onwards, the doctor and patient appear as subjects with rights and duties, and the question is no longer a practical, technical question of what works in treatment, but a formal, legal question of permissibility. This subject, possessing rights and enabled to make claims on the basis of these rights, is the basic form of law itself, and it's the succession of these subjects linked together by claims on one another that composes what Pashukhanis calls the fundamental legal fabric. So the, the distinctive features of the legal form, he argues, arise in the context of competing interests, but their purest realisation, the, the, the sort of full realisation of the legal form, occurs under conditions of generalised commodity production and exchange in, in capitalism. And in arguing this, Pashukhanis draws explicit connections with, with the account of commodity fetishism, which we just heard quite a lot about, so maybe I'll skim over that a bit more quickly. Um, but so according to Marx, in a society where productive activity is governed by commodity exchange, the commodities themselves come to take on a particular significance, a life of their own. Production is organised not according to a particular plan or a set of purposes, but on the basis of values determined by exchange on the market. A concept, this concept of value arises in an attempt to equalise diverse human products and activities to make possible exchange according to equivalent standards. This in turn gives rise to a concept of value as located in the commodities themselves. As Rubin, who uh, Anselm also mentioned, puts it, the fact that production relations are not established only for things, but through things, is what gives production relations among people a materialised, reified form and gives birth to commodity fetishism, the confusion between the material, technical and the social economic aspect of the production process. Instead of appearing as cooperative individuals, we appear as individual possessors of commodities and it appears to be the commodities themselves that motivate and animate the activity. And in a sense they do. These ideas are a reflection of the way the commodity is really organised. Um, However, while a real reflection of the exchange process, this fetishism also serves to conceal the true nature of production relations. By making the economy appear as a collection of interacting things rather than human relationships, it masks the character of these relationships. Uh, crucially, fetishism itself takes on a sort of objective reality. It's not mere illusion, as Anselm said as well. So there's a footnote in Capital, right, when Marx corrects the Italian economist Galliani by pointing out that when he said, value is a relation between things, he ought to have added a relation concealed between a material shell. And since fetishism takes on this objective reality, it cannot be dispelled merely through demonstrating the social nature of value. Marx insists that the theoretical analysis of value marks an epoch in the history of mankind's development, but by no means banishes the semblance of objectivity possessed by the social characteristics of labour. It follows from this that these ideas ought to be examined in their connection to material life and never assumed to have objectivity independent of it, but it also follows that such ideas will persist until there is a change in the material conditions of human life itself. So Pashikhanis believes that the, the legal form can be seen, on, seen as arising on substantially the same basis and possessing the same basic structure and function as the commodity form. Just as society organised organized on the basis of commodity, commodity exchange requires a standard of value by which diverse human beings, their activities and products can be compared and measured, it also requires a concept that relates human beings as willing agents to those products and to each other. For Blasikhanis, this concept is the legal subject, which he sees as arising coextensively at the same time as and part of the same process as uh, the concept of value. So I'll skip that quotation. 
actually no, I won't because it's very important. I'll skip a different quotation later. Um, this is Patrick Ramis. Just as in the commodity, the multiplicity of use values natural to a product appears simply as the shell of value, and the concrete types of human labor are dissolved into abstract human labor as the creator of value, so also the concrete multiplicity of the relations between man and objects manifests itself as the abstract will of the owner. All concrete peculiarities which distinguish one representative of the genus Homo sapiens from one another dissolve in the abstraction of man in general, man as legal subject. Uh, so for Pashikanis, the commodity production results in the highest development of the legal form as such, the completely abstract legal subject who acquires the significance of a mathematical point, a centre in which a number of rights are concentrated. Um, I'll skip this a bit. He also talks, this also lends a particular understanding of the state. So he, he's very insistent that the legal form is not, in fact, the product of the state, but in, in a way, the, the functions of the state arise on the basis of the legal form, that the legal subject is prior to the state, not determined by it. Um, and he also talks about, he also links this development of the legal form to what he calls the, the ethical form, which he sees as, as actually saying something very similar to Adorno, it's, it's kind of purest realisation is in Kant. And he does seem to think that the ethical form too uh, has a sim has similar origins to the commodity form. So my, my question is, can Pashukanis' analysis of the legal form be similarly applied to the form taken by theories of justice? I argue that it can. Uh, in particular, the structural features involved in these theories closely resemble the structure that Pashukanis sees as inherent in the legal and the ethical form. Firstly, there is the distinctive role of the subject as an independent possessor of rights to certain entitlement. Those subjects are possessed of a fundamental moral equality, represented as the recipients of their just deserts, their fair share of society's goods, however broadly or narrowly understood. Secondly, there's the distributed goods themselves, understood as divisible and distributable according to some appropriate standards that are fixed in advance. And finally, there must, by definition, be some sort of legitimate authority which does the distributing. Um, and I think these features match up very clearly with the structure of the legal form that Pashikanis is talking about. Um, and moreover, they, just like the value form and the legal form, seem to both reflect a certain reality and also to mask important features of that reality. So I was going to give three examples, but I think maybe I'll just give one or two. Um, so first of all, Iris Marion Young, who I quoted earlier, has uh, stressed that the way that the distributive paradigm adopted by these theories tends to systematically draw our attention away from goods which cannot easily be understood in distributive terms. So it's a non, most obviously non-material goods, so her analysis is of power. Um, either, so either what happens is the issue of power is completely evaded uh, in, in favour of wealth or resource distribution, or there's an attempt to conceive power itself as distribution, as a sort of stuff that can be possessed by individuals in greater or lesser amounts are distributed across across them as kind of separate nodes within a structural system. Um, what that obscures is the fact that power is a relationship and not a thing. It's not a thing that people, one person has more or less of. It's a, it's a particular kind of set of relationships. It's secondly, as, um, as Young says, in conceiving it in purely quantifiable terms, you get the impression that it's a sort of one person just has more power than another, when in fact power only functions as a complicated network of power. One person only has power over another person because of a series of third parties willing to do stuff. Uh, and, that, and, and Young argues that seeing power distributively, systematically masks that fact. I think it's also true of some non-material goods, and in particular non-material goods that Marxists should really care about, in particular the means of production themselves. The means of production, large, complicated things that require cooperative, uh, cooperative work to employ, don't fit well into a system of ownership which requires, this be, requires them to be distributed across separate, discrete individual subjects. I think if you were, were to seriously think through what it would mean to own the means of production in common, it would not be according to a set of individually isolated individuals owning shares of it. Um, and the second concern, this, yeah, the second concern that I'll talk about 
is the, it, which appears to develop as a kind of natural result of seeing society as requiring a set of pre-given goods that are to be distributed, is the conception of a distributive agency itself, which appears from outside the process in order to perform the redistribution. Uh, if, if production relations themselves remain intact, an alternative distribution could only be achieved by an outside agency intervening in what appear to be natural economic processes. And the distributive model merely assumes the existence of such an agency. Um, and you get this consistently. If you've, as I have had to at various stages, read Rawls and Rawls acolytes over and over again, the, the failure to engage with the state as a real thing, possessed of real social relationships and real actors who compete for control over it, rather than, than as a neutral body essentially just intervening to redistribute some stuff is astonishing, very powerful and, and you know, again, Young has written better than I can about that. So, I'll skip to uh, what I think it, what I think acknowledging the force of this critique practically means. Um, and I think it does, it, it, it should cast doubt on the value of Marxist theories of justice in the sense that a, a theory that I began with. I don't think it necessarily means we ought to abandon language of justice altogether. And it's useful here to return to the context where Pashukanis was writing. So the main target of his argument is those who sought to paint bourgeois law as purely ideological, as a set of ideas whose, whose only role was to legitimise capitalist production relations, but in a way reflected nothing in reality. They were just kind of pure figments of the imagination. But for Mashikanis, developing the analogy with commodity fetchism was part of emphasizing that it's not mere ideology, but it reflects social processes. So he says, the principle of legal subjectivity is not only an instrument of deceit and a product of the hypocrisy of the bourgeoisie, but it's the same time a concretely effective principle, which is embodied in bourgeois society from the moment it emerges from and destroys feudal patriarchal society. The victory of this principle is not only and not so much an ideological process, but is rather an actual process, making human relations into legal relations, which accompanies the development of the economy based on the commodity and on money, and which is associated with profound universal changes of an objective kind. This is partly part of a polemic with those who believe that after the revolution it was possible to replace bourgeois law with proletarian law. And Pashukanis, is in, uh, he says that while that demand appeared to be revolutionary par excellence, what it in fact does is proclaim the immortality of the legal form. It strives to wrench this form from the particular historical conditions which have helped it help bring it to full fruition, presented as capable of permanent renewal. Pashukanis' point is that there is no proletarian law, in a sense. That's his kind of provocative claim. There is only bourgeois law, and bourgeois law will wither away. But for as long as it persists, it will be bourgeois law and ought to be recognised as such. Um, so he is saying that it will wither away, or it ought to be expected to wither away. He's not saying that it is possible or even desirable to abandon it instantly. Indeed, what he calls for instead is a recognition and acknowledgement that these forms are historically specific and should be recognised as such. The proletariat may well have to utilise these forms, but that in no way implies they could be developed further or permeated by a socialist content. Uh, in order to do this, the proletariat must take a soberly critical attitude, not only towards the bourgeois state and bourgeois morality, but also towards their own state and their own morality. Phrased differently, they must be aware that both the existence and the disappearance of these forms are historically necessary. And it's positions like that one that put him on the collision course with Stalinism, at least I would argue, and I think it's a plausible claim. So we, of course, are a long way from Hashikanis' position. We are not in a post-revolutionary situation. Like I don't think it's controversial to say. But I do think there's, a, um, there's some lessons to be taken. And I think it's that if we are to use these kind of argument claims about justice and adopt a form of justice, it has to be not as grand theories that pro proclaim ideal, that they apply ideally to all societies, but precisely as specific particular historical features of society. That's precisely, I think, what the Rawlsian approach cannot do. I think structurally it cannot be. It claims these principles to be ideals and thus cannot rec recognize them as specific historical contexts. But it doesn't mean necessarily that we should abandon that language altogether. What it means is asking questions of, of power, of uh, who benefits when, for example, we talk about a, um, 
uh, and there's this demand for a universal basic income to become increasingly popular. Now, one possibility is to say that's a distributed demand and unnecessary. Another is to make that demand, but also make it clearly and precisely as a historically specific demand, recognize its fetishistic character, and also ask the additional question, who does the distributing? Who has influence over that distributing? The questions that Lenin called who whom questions, questions of power. And in that way, I think we might know how to use these, these fetishes as still part of a, a transforming society today.